good friends from the Foreign Policy Initiative. With that, let me turn it over to you, Chris. Uh, thank you so much, Cliff. Uh, it, it's an incredible pleasure for us to be here uh, at FED. Uh, my name is Chris Griffin. I'm the Executive Director at the Foreign Policy Initiative. Um, it, it, it's a particular pleasure to be here at FED for two reasons, one of which is that our initial event space on Capitol Hill wasn't available because of the government <laughs> shutdown, so we're especially grateful. Uh, yeah. But anytime we can partner with this organization, which does so much important work to promote the right of free and democratic nations. Uh, to promote the right of free and democratic nations to protect themselves from the common threats we face is just an incredible opportunity for the Foreign Policy Initiative. None of those threats is greater than the prospect of a nuclear armed Iran. This week, as you all know, US and European diplomats are meeting with their Iranian counterparts to discuss the possibility of peacefully halting the Iranian nuclear program. As those negotiations proceed, buttressed by the hope at Western capitals that Iran is now governed by moderates who aspire to end what their foreign minister has called an unnecessary crisis, it is important to ask who's really calling the shots in Tehran? And what are the prospects and under what conditions could an agreement be possible? It's a pleasure to introduce today two expert speakers who will address these critical questions. First up will be Ali Alfone, a senior fellow here at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. <coughs> Ali came to FDD from the American Enterprise Institute. Ah, there we go. <laughs> um, right now I'll talk in a regular voice. Uh, where he was a resident fellow and I had the pleasure of working alongside him. Ali's conducted groundbreaking research into how the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps came to dominate Iranian politics, an argument that he fully developed in his recently published book, Iran Unveiled, How the Revolutionary Guards is Transforming Iran from a Theocracy into Military Dictatorship, which is published in April of this year and which I highly commend. Ali is a graduate of the University of Copenhagen. Also speaking today will be J. Matthew McKinnis a resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, where he focuses on Iran, American security policy in the Middle East, and the effectiveness of the U.S. Intelligence Committee. Matthew joined AAI from the Department of Defense, where he was a senior analyst and held other leadership positions. A graduate of Eckerd College, Matt attained a master's degree at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies and New York University. It's a pleasure to share the panel with them today, and it's a pleasure to be here at FDD, and with that, Ollie, if you could begin our conversation. Uh, thank you so much, Chris, for your kind uh, words. And ladies and gentlemen, welcome to, to, to FTD. Thank you for joining us in uh, this debate about uh, Iran. Uh, much of the debate and analysis about the negotiations in Geneva is unfortunately detached about the domestic political realities in Tehran. But the Rouhani government is not operating in a vacuum. There are other power centers within Iran. Each of them have their own interests and motives. And this is going to be the subject that I will be elaborating on in the few minutes that I have my, at my disposal to begin with. As the invitation indicates, uh, we believe that there are fundamentally three power centers in Iran, all of which have an extremely important influence on foreign policy and national security decision making. The Supreme Leader, Ayatollah Khamenei, President Rouhani and his cabinet, and of course, the Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps, which is not only a military organization executing policies of the government, but also an institution which is actively engaged in shaping of those policies. The interplay of these three power centers is going to impact the policy outcomes, not only at the Geneva talks, but also when Iran is expected to implement promises made in Geneva. Let's begin with uh, President Rouhani. President Rouhani uh, only made one single election promise in the course of the presidential election in Iran, and that was to improve Iran's economy by the means of delivering sanction relief. That was the sole promise President Rouhani made to the Iranian public. He 
he did not make promises of liberalizing the political system. He did not make promises of liberalizing Iran's economy. He only promised the Iranian public that he was going to deliver sanctions. He is now engaged in talks in Geneva. His background is not particularly promising. He wrote in his own nuclear memoirs that the purpose of his diplomacy in the 1990s and, and, and towards 2003 agreements was in reality to buy time uh, in order to develop Iran's nuclear program. It was not to stop it. So that background is not particularly promising when it comes to our expectations uh, about the Geneva talks and Mr. Rouhani's intentions. But he wants to deliver sanction relief at the very least. So much is clear. He also knows that Iran's economy is in a terribly bad shape. Uh, and they are discovering every single day more bad news. For example, the other days in Donya Yaktasad, one of the economic newspapers in Iran, it was written that contrary to previous reports that Iran's gold reserve was five, uh, uh, 500 tons, in reality, Iran's gold reserve is limited to 100 tons. In other words, you know, this was the propaganda of the previous director of the central bank. And Iran has also uh, greater difficulties uh, accessing foreign exchange reserves, foreign currency, as a recent report made by uh, the FDD uh, and also Rubini uh, documents. So these challenges Mr. Rouhani wants to meet by delivering sanction relief. On the other hand, we have Supreme Leader Khamenei. Supreme Leader Khamenei's position is also interesting. Uh, on September 17th, he made a speech which has now become the point of reference for the entire Iranian public. He made mention of uh, the fact that he was not opposed to diplomacy, and he also said that he believed in what he called heroic flexibility. And he also specifically said that every once in a while, a wrestler, you know, wrestling being the national sport of Iran, needs to show heroic flexibility. Uh, Interestingly, heroic flexibility is also the subtitle of a book translated by Supreme Leader Khamenei in the 1960s. That was a reference to the third Imam of the Shia, Hassan, who made peace with the Sunni rulers. In other words, in order to preserve the Shia faith and preserve the survivors of the household of the Prophet, peace be upon him, Imam Hassan made peace with the usurpers. And this statement made by Mr. Khamenei was interpreted by the Iranian public and also by international observers as the willingness of Ayatollah Khamenei to make a strategic shift. So there seems to be, I'm not so convinced that Mr. Khamenei is, is totally decided, but he's sending some of the right signals that we would expect and be hopeful. Reactions from the Revolutionary Guards, on the other hand, have been very, very different. Right after the heroic flexibility speech, Brigadier General Hossein Salami, number two man of the Revolutionary Guards, said that flexibility has no place in the strategy and doctrine of the Revolutionary Guards. Mr. Mohammad Reza Nari, who is the head of the Basij Militia, the youth organization more or less of the Revolutionary Guards, he made another speech in which he said that people who talk about heroic flexibility and the peace of Imam Hassan are ignorance. And the peace of Imam Hassan was an infamy and shameful for Muslims and the Shia in all eternity. Mr. Major General uh, Jafari, head of the Revolutionary Guards, he made uh, a television appearance in which he said that heroic flexibility in reality means that one should not deviate at all from the strategy and the ideology of the revolution. So he presented his own interpretation of the statements of Supreme Leader Khamenei. And then we have seen other statements made by the Revolutionary Guards actually in public opposing the words of Supreme Leader Khamenei. In other words, we have three power centers, each with their own agendas, each with their own strategies. We have the Rouhani government, which seems to be willing to give some concessions in Geneva in order to achieve sanction relief. We have Supreme Leader Khamenei somewhere in the middle. He needs to take into factor the fact that giving any concessions would be 
a defeat and possibly lead to losing face in the public in Iran. And we have the Revolutionary Guards, which has everything to lose if the Islamic Republic reaches an agreement with the West. And the Revolutionary Guards is also actively engaged, at least in its own words and propaganda, in a tactic to derail talks in Geneva. There are three different ways. How the question for Washington policymaking community is this: How do you help the Iranian leadership make the right decision and give the necessary concessions? My answer to this may seem counterintuitive to some, not necessarily colleagues and friends present here today, but but some people in in, in Washington. Rather than giving into Iranian demands and rather than removing sanctions. Washington and the United States administration should actually increase the pressure of sanctions if Washington wants to help President Rouhani. If you want to strengthen the bargaining position of President Rouhani domestically in Iran, increase sanctions. Don't decrease them. There may be a division of labor between Congress on the one hand and the administration on the other, but there must be continuation of the pressure. Without the shadow of the sword hanging over the heads of Supreme Leader Khamenei and the commanders of the Revolutionary Guards, there is not going to be any kind of peace, not that of Imam Hassan or any other type of peace. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ali. Insightful remarks, as always. Um, Matthew. Uh, thanks again, Chris, um, and for FTD for uh, putting together this event. This is uh, my, uh, my First uh, talk since leaving the government Monday, a month before the uh, shutdown. Uh, but I am uh, very happy to, uh, to be here and to be with AI uh, working on uh, this really critical issue. Um, first, in, in reaction to uh, some of uh, Ali's comments, I would say that this is, you know, and Ali is, 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 uh, has done some very significant work uh, in this field that we all at, at AI still uh, uh, refer to, build upon. Uh, certainly has given us enormous insight uh, into the regime. And I think that Ali is absolutely right on the mark when it comes to the challenge between these, these three power centers. I, I think part of the, the difficulty for us uh, in the US you know, is seeing how the regime uh, is a very kind of organic, uh, organic mechanism, for lack of a better term, in that it's not monolithic, as, as, you, as you know, but at the same time, there's a there's a challenge of seeing in too much uh, potential you know strong chasms and factions. And I think that there's a certain uh, degree of give and take that goes on in the system that the supreme leader has to to constantly uh, gauge, monitor, shape, uh, empower, disempower uh, different individuals. Uh, and one of the things that I, I think was happening right now, and I agree with Ali on this issue, is that you're seeing a, a, a kind of a Balancing of, of factors and players going on after the last uh, eight years uh, between the Ahmadinejad uh, presidency and the real stripping of, of a smaller cohort of IRGC uh, elements around the Supreme Leader. I think to some degree that you're you're beginning to see a, a, a kind of factions and elements, and again I hesitate to use that term faction too much, uh, but the other networks within the regime. Uh, that are providing, in, a, uh, in essence, a different voice and a different dynamic and a different thrust uh, that is, uh, is, is, frankly, I think the Supreme Leader is appreciating right now. Uh, and I think that there is a, a, an ability that he is, has been able to do for a number of decades now, take the various forces uh, that, that exist among that, that elite group, whether they're clerical elites, the political elites, uh, the IRGC, the military elites, uh, economic elites, uh, and be able to balance and, 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 and massage those efforts. Now, he's not always very successful, not always successful in doing that, so I don't want to overemphasize <laughs> that he's you know, kind of a true puppet master. That's not really what's, what I think is happening here. Uh, but I do think we're seeing, since the election of Hani, uh, an opportunity for him to realign uh, some of the internal dynamics of the regime. Now, one thing that uh, that I think in particular that is uh, has been very interesting, uh, you know, from this this new group that Rouhani has uh, brought in uh, from the uh, 
from the you know, not only IRGC, but clerical and political leadership. There's a lot of elements here that uh, I believe reflect some of the older networks around uh, President Patani, President Ref Sanjani, which is not terribly surprising. Uh, elements that we thought after 2009 were really just dead. Uh, they were not going to be reasserting themselves. Um, but at the same time that you're, you're seeing this kind of alternate group around uh, Major General Shankani, who's the new secretary of the Supreme Council for National Security, um, his group, his deputies, uh, and many of which have also IRDC uh, backgrounds, affiliations, uh, that you're seeing a kind of a different group uh, emerge that I think in some ways is, is, is scary to the, the existing um, IRGC elements that have been uh, really at the top of the, of the, of the command network in, some, in the last you know, five to ten years. Especially given that the, all these elements, and, and I can point you to AI's work by uh, Will Fulton on, on the, uh, the IRGC command network, uh, what you're seeing is the, you know, a, an element that we have not necessarily been focused on uh, but I think this is still resident there, elements that have uh, an extensive history during the Iran-Iraq War, uh, that were where those foundational relationships were built back uh, during the 1980s. And I think you're seeing a, an interesting uh, mosaic develop uh, within this new group. Going for more towards how the U.S. should be interpreting current uh, U.S., uh, current Iranian uh, uh, moves and diplomatic gestures, what's been happening in Geneva for the past couple of days. I mean, what I see is, is two kind of key elements. One is we need to be thinking through um, what is driving this shift within the, senior, within the senior leadership. What is changing the calculus for them to come to the table? Uh, and the second is be, be wary of seeing uh, Rouhani uh, in particular as too much of an independent actor in this, as someone that we need to just kind of find that right relationship with so we can kind of look into each other's eyes, whatever the, 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 the metaphor is uh, that we want to use, that that's going to be very problematic and potentially a real pitfall for our, you know, for our side of negotiations with the EU and others. You know, this is actually a very similar dynamic to what has happened in the last 10 years about the, the focus on, uh, for example, uh, Gossip Soleimani. Uh, I, I point you to a New Yorker had a great article a couple of weeks ago by Dexter Wilkins uh, going into the, uh, the, the, the nature of, of Soleimani and the, and the real kind of obsession that the West, uh, that Israel and others have had uh, with the leader of the Quds Force and the IRG, inside the IRGC. And, and, uh, and certainly there's no doubt that Soleimani has an enormous amount of power in the system uh, within, within the IRGC, but there's been a kind of a consistent desire uh, because of our lack of communication uh, with, uh, with the regime. If we can just kind of find that one relationship with Suleimani, get the right interlocutor, uh, be able to kind of sit across the table for him, we can help not only change things at the tactical operational level with what that particular element of this force is doing, uh, but that we can, that Suleimani can bring back uh, the, uh, a good, you know, some kind of deal to convince the Supreme Leader, hey, we should change core policy. And sometimes when I'm reading about what's happening with Rouhani right now, there's a sort of, kind of parallel with that, and this desire if we can, if we can just strengthen Rouhani enough uh, in his relationship, you know, and he negotiate, that he can bring back the right deal and give us a supreme leader. In many ways, that I'm not saying that that's not possible, but history is you know shown with the relationship of the supreme leader and with these key actors that ultimately they are still bound within parameters that the supreme leader has been sent out. And in many ways, they're still more executors of, of, of the regime policy as opposed to the, uh, the real generators of it. Um, so that's something that is a dynamic that we have to be careful of. Going back to what is changing the calculus, uh, what I think is the, the, the one of the frameworks that is perhaps most useful to understanding Iran's calculus on the nuclear program uh, is what we call the Inside AI, we were kind of developing this theory about the, uh, the decision-making triangle, uh, the three points that have been driving decision-making. One is the will, the will of the leadership, their desire, their objectives, their strategies. Um, the second is external pressures. And the third is the technical capabilities. Uh, and in between, the space between these three elements uh, over the last uh, decade or more is what's been driving this decision for Iran uh, to, to push for program that is pursued so far. Um, and fundamentally, what one can say 
based on all the act activities we've seen from Iran, is that you know, Iran is pushing to have a capability uh, for a nuclear weapon, but they haven't pulled the trigger yet. Uh, and the question is, why is that? Why are they, at such great economic and political uh, cost, have they pushed this far and still not actually uh, pull, uh, pull the trigger to, to do a weapon? And I think part of that really ties to the fact that there is a strong will, I would surmise, there is a strong will to have this capacity, and that will is tied to their existential fears, uh, their uh, fear of defending the regime, preserving the regime, desire to deter potential invasion or, or uh, efforts to overthrow uh, this, uh, the, the current uh, republic, as well as prestige and desire for leadership in, inside, the, uh, inside the, the region. And that's one of the questions is, has you know, the, those fundamental drivers for having this kind of capability have those existential fears retreated to some degree? Is, there, is the regime actually feeling more secure right now? Uh, and that has lessened the, or has given more space for the regime to, to, to back uh, or to, to find a, a better path. Are they, do they have greater confidence in their status in the region? Is what's happening in Syria right now with the greater sense of that Assad is probably going to survive? Uh, and their, their interest in that, you know, is that still giving them greater confidence? And frankly, also their conventional uh, power projection capacities, which you can recognize why a regime like Iran would want to have a nuclear capacity, uh, because it doesn't have the, 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 the ability from a conventional military standpoint to really defend the regime from a potential invasion uh, like Iraq in 2003. Uh, and so that's something that, you know, if they are feeling more confident in their missile capacity, in their naval capacities, uh, their defensive capacities, their uh, Cyber and satellite and anti-satellite capacities. You know, they may and they may be feeling like, well, maybe we don't have to have this, uh, you know, something as, as critical as the nuclear program, at least like that. The other element of pressure, the threat of a potential military strike, and the economic pain that has been uh, incurred because of the sanctions has absolutely put what I think the main brakes on them pulling uh, pulling the trigger and pursuing an actual weapon. Um, this is something that I think is, is, is very, the economic pain is intense, as Ali has pointed out, uh, and there's great frustration in the population. Uh, but I think that that is something that is, uh, is really the particular driver right now, and I think Ali's absolutely onto something here, that the, that pressure, if you want this particular conflagration of factors to keep pushing the regime to finding a better path, a better deal, that pressure needs to remain. Um, at the same time, I think that they're increasingly perhaps doubtful that an actual military strike is, is in the offing um, from either the U.S. or from Israel. And I, I think that that uh, calculus on their part, whether they, they are potentially subject to that, uh, is, is perhaps diminishing, especially as they've seen how, how things have played out with Syria. And finally, on the capability issue, as they made a significant progress uh, in centrifuge uh, production and, and modernization and enrichment capacity, as well as missile uh, capabilities, uh, the, they may be sensing at this point in time that they, they far, they're far enough along that they have more room to negotiate. And of course, it also brings up the, the scary possibility, and I have the correct knowledge of this, but you know, if, if, they, if they are feeling more confident, does that perhaps entail, as we've seen in, in, in the past with, uh, with facilities like Bordeaux and, uh, and others, that is there, a, is there a covert capability out there uh, that may be, uh, and again, that's just pure speculation on my part, uh, but that is something that if they're feeling more confident at this point to come to the table than they are, um, why is that? Uh, so that, in, in, in some, what I would see is that the U.S. needs to think Iran may actually, as opposed to necessarily coming to, uh, you know, coming to Geneva from a position of incredible pain and weakness, that they are perhaps in a position of strength. Uh, and that's why you're seeing this particular maneuverability right now. Um, and so that's something that I really do uh, want us to, uh, to focus on uh, and as we think through potential options that Iran may be offering, uh, that this is not something that we have necessarily wrong and we need to be careful. Is that all? Any questions? Uh, thank you, so much, Matt. Um, we'll ask one question before opening it up to the floor. And would appreciate if I could have you each respond to a point that the other raised. Um, Holly, in terms of Matthew's breakdown of will, pressure, and capabilities as three driving factors, um, do you see the different 
components of the Iranian leadership perhaps having different minds on those issues. In an analogy that comes to mind with was late in the Second World War, it was a division of the Japanese High Command where the Army saw the map and they're thinking to Asia, the Navy saw the map and they had no more Navy. And you had a very different view whenever it came to giving advice. Um, Matthew, if I could have you respond after all to a point that he raised um, about the idea that perhaps the best way if we want to have a deal with Iran is to increase pressure on Iran so that he has more leverage at home, something to accomplish. Um, I assume the you know, converse implication of that is that if the sanctions crack, um, that that could be significantly diminishing for his position at home. And we'd appreciate your views on the prospects of what sanctions relief could mean for internal leverage that moderate sitting on the domain. That, that's exactly right. Different parts of the state bureaucracy in Iran and governmental organizations see the world in very, very different ways. Uh, and they also, you know, different parts of the bureaucracy try to impact uh, the thinking and mentality of Supreme Leader uh, Khamenei. For example, when it comes to how advanced Iran's nuclear program is, I actually believe that uh, the Revolutionary Guards, which is in charge of the program, systematically delivers over-optimistic reports to Supreme Leader Khamenei in an attempt to convince him not to give in to pressure, not to give any concessions, because Iran is this close to getting what the Revolutionary Guards and Ayatollah Khamenei desire. On the other hand, other parts of the government bureaucracy, for example, the Iran Atomic Energy Organization may, have, may deliver a more realistic assessment of the advances in Iran's nuclear program. And of course, Mr. Ha uh, Rouhani would be pushing the agenda of the Iran Atomic Energy Organization. When it has meetings with, with, with Supreme Leader Khamenei, the Revolutionary Guard sends a very, very different set of, of, of reports. When it comes to the external pressure, uh, the Revolutionary Guards consistently sees the and presents the United States in its own media as a declining world power. They compare the United States with Great Britain after World War II. And particularly, President Obama's United Nations General Assembly speech was interpreted the wrong way by the Revolutionary Guards. For example, Major General Qasem Soleimani said that President Obama's promise that the United States was committing itself not to change the regime in Iran, in reality was an, uh, the United States admitting that it is totally impotent and incapable of changing the regime. This is how Major General Soleimani saw the open the, the remarks of uh, President Obama. It was not interpreted as a, an extended hand of friendship. It was seen as a sign of weakness. Uh, former chief of the Revolutionary Guards, Major General uh, Safavi, he said the same thing. He said that this is the proof that the, the United States is retreating uh, and it, it is incapable of in, in, engaging in military operations uh, in, in the Middle East uh, in, in, in the future. So again, you have different interpretations of the world which uh, uh, actually also uh, end up shaping policy making among different different organizations. And, and the final question of course is who has the leader, uh, leader's ears? Who the leader is going to, to, to listen to? And let me also just, you know, final point, say that Supreme Leader cannot ignore the Revolutionary Guards because he is dependent on the Revolutionary Guards for his domestic survival. Survival. Iran is not a democracy. The Supreme Leader needs the Revolutionary Guards as an instrument of oppression to protect him against those millions of Iranians who went to the streets of Tehran back in 2009. If it was not for the support and activities of the Revolutionary Guards, the regime would have collapsed back in 2009. Supreme Leader Khamenei knows that. Can he afford? totally to ignore the wishes of the revolutionary guards? I don't think so. Yeah. As I mentioned, I do think that the economic pressure is something that is absolutely part of what is driving them to the table. And my, my assessment is that Rouhani does, that is his, if he's trying to actually push the regime in a direction, that is the most important hammer that has, is that the, the, the sanctions, what he was, as I pointed out, what uh, was the, key, the critical part of his platform during the election in June, um, you know, if he loses that hammer, 
uh, of the economic sanctions. Uh, it, it is something that, that weakens his, um, his overall position uh, and his ability to, to push uh, the, the Supreme Leader and be able to push back against other factions that don't want him in the deal. Um, so I would agree with that um, up to a point. I do think that if, if there is, you know, if is there increasing sanctions, there also has to be to some degree a light at the end of the tunnel that, uh, uh, that Rouhani can communicate to the rest of the, the leadership. Uh, so that if, you know, if we are looking at potentially, and I know certainly there, there is discussion of this on the Hill uh, and other places of, of, of it potentially you know, not only keeping sanctions on uh, and, and really resisting what the administration may want to do, uh, but potentially even increasing them, uh, I think that that is a, you know, it, it is probably something that is needed during these intermediate months, but if it's something that is still not also geared uh, with uh, some incentive or what this will look like, you know, if we come through on, on a deal that those slides can agree to, I think it's going to be very difficult uh, for Rouhani to, uh, to, because then eventually Rouhani looks like he's not capable of providing anything out of these negotiations, that there's no line at the end of the top. Thank you both so much. Uh, for you, any questions, as a courtesy to Ollie and Matthew, ask, if you're asking a good question, please identify yourself and your affiliation as a courtesy to each other uh, so we can keep, we have about half an hour, uh, that please keep questions to a question and please keep them uh, brief so that we can ha have a fruitful discussion. Uh, the floor is open. Yes, sir. Um, Georgia Bailey, the Bundy's information. And, and there's a bike coming around. Okay. Um, assessing Rouhani's mindset and, and looking, I guess, at three areas when we're looking at the uh, Iranian problems. One, domestic, second, the nuclear program, and thirdly, the regional meddling. Do we know anything about Rouhani's intention regarding uh, Iran's regional role? Uh, I mean, we know, for example, he released maybe some political prisoners, he's willing to negotiate regarding the nuclear program, but for example, do we know what he wants to do with Syria, and Lebanon with Hezbollah, and other places? Thank you. Thank you for the very, very important question. Uh, as you all know, uh, President Rouhani has for years and years been a member of the Supreme National Security Council where he served as secretary. He was devising the policies of the Islamic Republic of Iran in the region, and there does not seem to be any major difference between the worldview of uh, President Rouhani and that of uh, Supreme Leader Khamenei or even the, that of the Revolutionary Guards. Uh, more specifically, you know, about Syria, there were some developments. Uh, some months ago, uh, when uh, everybody expected the Bashar al-Assad regime to collapse, Mr. al-Assad, for the first time uh, in public, you know, he actually said that uh, the Bashar al-Assad regime has used chemical weapons against his own population, and we know what happens to dictators who use weapons of mass destruction against their own population, reference to Saddam Hussein, of course. Uh, but then, Mr. Assange and Jenny's viewpoint changed, not only because of internal pressure, but also because they discovered that maybe Bashar al-Assad's regime is going to survive. At some point, when they thought that Bashar al-Assad was going down, they were ready to throw Mr. Assad under the bus. But when they found out that the United States was not ready to use force against Bashar al-Assad, why on earth should they get, get, get rid of Bashar al-Assad? He's a good ally. So we don't see any significant difference, unfortunately, in the strategic worldview of President Rouhani and, and other uh, members. Differences may be tactical, but there is absolutely no difference when it comes to strategy. Yeah, I, I would just <coughs> add on that point that uh, the, the Rouhani regime, they are still fundamentally, you know, I would say hawkish is not so the best term. I mean, they're they're certainly approaching things from a more pragmatic standpoint. But the the, the point that I was making on Syria is something that I I personally been trying to stress uh, since uh, joining AI is the one of the problems in the debate about uh, is our Syria policy and looking at Iran's relationship with Syria. We tend to forget how um, important and frankly almost existential the Syria issue is for Iran. Uh, that it's not just simply that Iran is a great you know, ally of Syria that it was throughout the, the, the last 30 years, uh, and that they need the transit point to get to Hezbollah. Uh, it's more significant than that. Um, you know, 
Syria uh, during the 80s, if you can recall, you know, Syria was a, a key element to help sustain the Iranian regime during the Iran-Iraq War. Uh, so there, it, it, part of this, you know, goes back to the fact that these are two, um, these are two uh, republics that are, that are is very isolated uh, in, in the region, and they're, and they're frankly dependent on each other uh, to provide strategic depth, uh, to provide mutual deterrence. Uh, and if, if Syria, you know, was lost to Iran, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be Assad or not Assad. I, mean, I think Ali's absolutely right that as soon as, if Assad was going, Iran would find another way to be there. But Iran would need to be in Syria no matter what. Uh, because it's something that is that frankly would threaten the actual regime in Tehran uh, without having that capacity to to, to that strategic depth, that mutual deterrence uh, that Syria provides in addition to that ideological alignment, not so much in, in religion but uh, in, in religious ideology, but in the idea of that resistance to uh, to, to the West, to Israel, uh, and, and to other uh, the international system and global arrogance as they call it in the U.S. Um, but these are things that I think we underestimate how far Iran will go uh, in order to preserve its interest in Syria. Uh, and it's something that I think those, those core calculations of the regime was motivating their policies, they haven't really changed. Uh, and again, that's the reason why we have to approach these new directions we're seeing with diplomacy and tactics uh, with obviously great uh, suspicion and clear-sightedness about, you know, nothing's, at least my estimation, nothing's really changed. Or, but they do need to find um, a, 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 more, um, a better path to get where they want to go. So what about Hezbollah Rouhani? The connection of Hezbollah Rouhani, anything you have? The, the, the same thing. The same thing. I do not detect any, any difference at all. The, the, there are some uh, uh, interesting dynamics uh, with, with, between the Russian and the Gaza and, and Hezbollah, and, and the, the, there are some reports of unhappiness you know, you know, between Let's say you know Sheikh uh, Hassan Nasrallah and and Qasem Soleimani, but but these are smaller issues. I think the, the broad broad picture there is really no change. If I could just follow up on that great question, as an underlying question for these negotiations is if any agreement we reach with Iran, there's always a question: of how much certainty, whatever whatever can be agreed, that will result in the end of Iran's nuclear program. But it seems that the Iranian government can enjoy fairly great certainty that any easing of pressure will allow it to pursue an agenda in the region that is critical to American interests. Um, so how do you see a path to a happy outcome to these negotiations, or must all those issues be set aside to address the nuclear issue first? Well, like I said, it's hard to see, I mean, you know, given the state of issues between us Iran and the regional actors right now, in their perspective, you know, it, it is. I don't want to be too pessimistic, but it's hard to see, you know, a truly, you know, grand solution that's going to come out of this. Uh, I think that there is, uh, you, know, you know, even though there are some people that certainly wish for that, uh, and I, obviously I would sort of like to have a much better situation in the Iran uh, long term myself. But the, uh, well, I think what the, the possibility of being able to solve all of this. Is going to be the, you know, the challenge. So again, I think what they're what you're seeing from Rouhani uh, in particular is that they they're really on the economic front, and the isolation front. They're you know they can't really go much further down. And I think that they need to find a way um, to to improve their situation. But you know, aside from the economic issues, you know, there's a lot of things you know that are kind of turning the corner for Iran in the region. That I think that they very, frankly, very nervous about since, especially since the Arab Spring, um, where they originally thought they had a great opportunity to kind of change the, the equation in their favor. Things kind of pushed back against them uh, for a couple of years. Uh, you know, a lot of the, the other Arab uh, states were fairly resistant to what Iran was trying to do and take advantage of uh, in 2011 and 2012. Uh, in some ways, hardening the lines within the, within the region uh, between the, those aligned with Iran and those not. Um, so I think, uh, for many ways, though, I think given that, particularly because of Syria, uh, and because of what they see as the U.S. Uh, unwillingness to really deeply engage in the region, or uh, you know, frankly, some, a certain degree of un, you know unwillingness to kind of maintain even our current commitments there, I think they're over long term. And again, Iran does the long term. 
I think they're seeing themselves in a stronger position. Uh, well, I, I had the opportunity to have a conversation with one of the senior advisors, very, very close advisors of uh, President Rouhani. And uh, he made the uh, you know, statement that Iran wanted to reach an agreement with the United States. My answer was, how about U.S. allies in the region? Do you really believe that you can bypass you know, the Arab regimes in the Persian Gulf? Do you believe that you can bypass Israel? You know, he said that he himself personally did not believe it. But President Rouhani and Ayatollah Khamenei and many others believed that it was possible to bypass everybody else in the entire region and make an agreement with the United States. This was his perception, and I think it's one of the weaknesses of the Rouhani administration. If they genuinely believe that uh, the U.S. is going to, to, to forsake and abandon all its allies in the region, I think it's a great mistake. Thank you very much for your uh, important uh, question. Uh, I think it's clear, abundantly clear to everyone that there is absolutely no enmity between the people of Iran and the people of the United States. Uh, America consistently comes up as one of the most popular places to study abroad for Iranians. A lot of Iranians look at their countrymen uh, who are now naturalized Americans living in, in America, a very, very successful life. A successful life that the regime in Tehran has denied them for the past 35 years. So there is no enmity. Uh, but for the prospects of having a Nixon in China uh, duplication when it comes to, to this regime, we truly need to have a unified leadership in Tehran. As long as there are three different actors, as we have been speaking about today, you know, revolutionary guards, the Rouhani government, and Supreme Leader Khamenei, each of whom pursue different policy objectives, I think it's going to be very, very difficult. Let's not forget, President Nixon managed to reach out to China and make the agreement with uh, Chairman Mao after the Cultural Revolution, where Chairman Mao more or less had slaughtered and massacred all the entire domestic opposition. So as long as there is no unity of command, as long as there is not a clear chain of command, as long as the Iranian state is not behaving as a unitary actor, it's going to be very, very difficult to have that kind of solution. But peace and, 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 and contacts between the peoples of America and Iran, we already have that. And the best ambassadors of Iran, and the worthiest, and the most noble ambassadors of Iran, are the Iranian-American community living in this country. Yeah, and I would just add on the, uh, the issue with the Supreme Leader. I, I agree that the, the sense of, of regime internal security is going to be a, a huge precondition for Iran to make any uh, significant moves. Uh, what I would add, though, I think at times, we, uh, you know, as much as there is a, 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 a simpatico between uh, the Iranian people and the American people, and I think in many ways, uh, you know, that there is there are fundamental strategic Common, uh, commonly held ideals and interest in the region that we could potentially have with Iran. The challenge is that this regime is still built on an, uh, on an ideology that is uh, fundamentally anti-Western and, uh, and anti, from their perspective, anti-imperialist. Uh, and, uh, and that's something that is is very, very difficult for you know the regime to overcome. I think there's a great desire on US for US uh, observers and diplomats 
to want to see a realpolitik Iran that they can deal with. Uh, and there are certainly elements of what Iran is doing in Iran's calculus that are, that are classically realpolitik. Uh, but there is something that, that we tend to really underestimate is that the, the, this is still, at their heart, at least from the Supreme Leader's perspective, a revolutionary regime. Uh, they are still out there to change the status quo, uh, both in the region and, frankly, globally. And we tend to dismiss the fact that they that, that still motivates their thinking, uh, and it's something that um, is going to be extremely difficult uh, to overcome. Uh, and it's uh, something that, that, again, gives me a certain degree of pessimism being able to, to go where we would like to. May I say a footnote to what Brother Ali over here? First of all, his name is Ali, not Ali. <laughs> He mentioned the third, uh, third Imam Hassan, right? He's the second. Sorry, that's Hussein. Hussein. Yeah, Hussein. Hussein, yeah. Hussein, Hussein, Hussein was different. Second was Hassan that agreed to make peace and be poisoned to it. So that's not a very good example. The third one is Hussein, and that's a very, very important factor for West to understand what is Hussein factor in that part. Research. Thank you. Further questions? There is another ideology, I mean, I, I thought a lot of Iran and I want to from your own perspective, that uh, Iran actually is two sections, it's uh, now uh, or two faction, uh, Supreme Leader and Rafsanjani, Rouhani representing Rafsanjani, and IRGC right now is divided between the two. So I'd like to get your perspective on what you think of this division. Uh, and the fight is really between Supreme Leader and the Rafsanjani, and Rafsanjani trying to bring moderation and everything. And also, I want to know, do you think that Iran will uh, completely abandon, or not completely, just abandon the nuclear intention? Because over and over again, they have said that this is our red line. We are not going to give up our uh, nuclear, having a nuclear bomb. And even this morning, they said, they insisted that the nuclear uh, ambition that they're having is just for peaceful matters. Uh, so, and it's different to have an Iran with a nuclear bomb and Iran with a nu without a nuclear bomb because their ambition is to occur and become a superpower in the region or in the world. So, what's your. Uh... Well, you know, I, we, we have difficulties believing the rhetoric of the Islamic Republic uh, saying that they do not harbor any ambitions for developing nuclear uh, weapons. Uh, because we time and again have seen international bodies discover unreported facilities in Iran. And the question, of course, arises if the uh, nuclear program in Iran has no military dimension, how come the United Nations uh, Atomic Energy Agency and other international inspection regimes and bodies end up discovering unreported facilities. Uh, there is absolutely no reason for the regime in Tehran to, to hide those activities if it has no, no military, military ambitions or, or objectives. Concerning the, the, the issue of uh, incremental forces within the regime pursuing the nuclear weapon strategy, I do agree with you. Whenever you establish a government bureaucracy with the aim of producing the bomb, that part of the bureaucracy gets its own life. It's just like introducing, let's say, uh, in, in American context, introducing, let's say, a, a welfare entitlement. When you first introduce it, it develops its own audience, demanding that service from the public sector. Uh, and and it, there is an interest group, a pressure group within the American public demanding that. The same thing, of course, goes for the Revolutionary Guards, which will be the sole and greatest beneficiary of Iran becoming an empire. Why? Because the IRGC is also going to be custodian of the bomb. They compare themselves and they want to see themselves playing the same role as the Pakistani military. Which institution in, 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 in Pakistan benefited most from Pakistan becoming a nuclear power? The military. This is the exactly same uh, uh, arguments and, and I'm sure debate that the IRGC is, is having uh, within, within the system. Concerning divisions uh, even within the IRGC and other types of, you know, understanding the balance of power within the regime. Yes, I do agree with you. There are different ways of looking at it. And, and Matthew actually mentioned in his uh, presentation uh, that some older members of the Revolutionary Guards have a different opinion than those who have commanding positions in the Revolutionary Guards today. Uh, 
Major, you know, Mr. Admiral Shamkhani is actually a very good example of that. Shamkhani is also a very special personality. First of all, he's ethnically Arab. So appointing someone like Shamkhani, who's fluent in Arabic, as the Secretary of the Supreme National Security Council was a gesture to Iran's neighbors, Arab neighbors. That was the first signal. Second, Admiral Shamkhani was the sole commander, high-ranking commander of the Revolutionary Guards, who, for the first time during the Iran-Iraq War, told uh, back then, you know, uh, Speaker of the Parliament Raf Sanjani, that the war was lost. He said that in 1987. At that time, it was an act of total betrayal. If anybody said that the war should stop and Iran was losing the war to Iraq. But Shamkhani was the first person to say this. And Mr. Rassanjani actually mentioned this in his memoirs. And back then, Mr. Rouhani would go to field trips to, to, to uh, inspect the front. So he knows Mr. Shamkhani from those years, and he trusts him. And there are some other commanders, more realistically minded commanders of the Revolutionary Guards, who know that if Iran continues the path of the nuclear bomb, the leader of Iran needs to drink from the chalice of poison, just like Khomeini had to drink from the chalice of poison in 1988. They know it, and they want to prevent it. This is the realistically minded IRGC commanders. But on the other hand, you have also the entire corporation of the revolutionary guard, which is benefiting from the fact that there is this ongoing level of crisis between Iran and the world. Why on earth should they give up and sacrifice their corporate interest for the interest of the state? They don't. Yeah, and, and I would uh, again just reiterate that the IRGC is something that is, uh, it is not a monolithic body. It is something that we have seen, you know, different elements uh, within a different Many of you may remember, you know, during the 2009 election, that the IRGC uh, was not coherently behind uh, Ahmadinejad. There's a, there's a lot of split for support there, so I think it's something to, to remember that part of what we have seen recently, you know, is a particular coterie of, of, of senior leaders in the IRGC that have congealed, uh, you know, around the Supreme Leader in the last decade or so, in particular, uh, with some of those that have, you know, I guess someone been isolated during the Ahmadinejad uh, period, uh, and that we're seeing a, a kind of a, a remixing of, 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 of the group right now. Uh, it's something to keep in mind. When it comes to the, uh, will they ever give up the nuclear, uh, the nuclear program? I don't think, I mean, certainly they will, they'll never be a giving up of, of the entire nuclear program, uh, because certainly they will always claim the need for energy and medical research. Uh, and so the question is really how far the program they're, uh, they're, they will uh, be willing to kind of pull back towards get that as a deal on the table. Uh, and, and for me, again, it goes back to those fundamental drivers of why they're pursuing this in the first place. Uh, and if that, that need for prestige uh, and the need for leadership in the region, as well as that sense of uh, uh, preserving the regime and, and that existential uh, challenge that they face, uh, being as isolated as they are and, and surrounded generally by enemies as they are, uh, that it, it would take an enormous change in their strategic outlook uh, to really feel that not, not having at least the latent capability is something that they absolutely have to have the reward. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Who used the wrestler analogy? And, and after saying that 
uh, you, you, every once in a while a wrestler needs to, needs, needs to show heroic flexibility, he also added your, your exact words. He said that a wrestler should always know where he stands and he also should know who his opponent is. He actually added that. You know, so, so you and I don't know how many agree on that, 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 that at the very least. And it is there. Um, Ayatollah Khamenei believes, you know, unfortunately, some of the propaganda that the revolutionary guards is, is producing. And, 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 and this is always a problem with ideological regimes, that some people in the system actually end up believing their own propaganda. And this, is, this is a genuine problem, because uh, we know, as a matter of fact, that Ayatollah Khamenei did not believe that sanction would matter. But now he has made the realization that they do matter. He needs to give in. But it took him eight years of Ahmadinejad presidency in order to achieve you know, that understanding that sanctions actually do matter. And it is harming the regime's ability to survive. Mr. Khamenei is unfortunately not a quick learner when it comes to that issue. Mr. Rouhani's you know, cabinet and the extremely competent team that he has around himself, they know. They know and they understand perfectly well because all of them, they had executive positions during the Rasanjani era and later also in, in, the, in the Khatami government. These people, when something fantastic happens whenever people are government officials because then you are responsible to, or towards your own public. You need to deliver. You cannot just talk ideology. Mr. Khamenei can talk ideology. Why? Because he has, in reality, no executive responsibility. He is not answering to the Iranian public. He is chosen by God and his wise region, you know, the Imam of the era, the Messiah, to be the leader of Iran. Therefore, he does not need to take you know, uh, very seriously the problems and challenges that, 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 that arise. The revolutionary guards may, may understand the problems that they are facing, particularly and the, the, the position of the United States and the ability of the United States to totally obliterate Iran. They may understand it but they don't want to understand it. Why? Because it serves their corporate interests to maintain Iran in a state of constant uh, crisis with the United States. That gives them a better position in the Iranian domestic political setting. I'm not saying that they're interested in engaging in our right to war, but they want to maintain a state of crisis with, with, with the United States and, and with the West. And also,